Bloop a doop a doo. Bloop a doop a da ba This is a new addition to the room. This is uh, our Mary Lou's new haircut. Oh, hi, Mary Lou. Mm -hmm. She's feeling snazzy. Hi, everybody. Today we are going to be talking about, we're just going to do some like off the cuff talking. We didn't really completely plan this out or really at all plan this out. <laughs> uh, we're talking I'm providing about, visual aids. Keep going. Right. Uh, we're talking about uh, RPGs and Dungeons and Dragons and JRPGs versus Western RPGs and whatever else feels like it fits in this conversation as we keep moving forward. This is largely inspired by Game Maker Toolkit's somewhat recent video about JRPGs, which I thought was really interesting. Since we are talking about 1987, in our next like year uh, reaction video, which is the year that the first Final Fantasy game was released. And since Ramin is such an expert now on, on Dungeons and Dragons, I thought we'd sort of just like talk about these things and see where, they're, where we're going with them. D&D is a game that was designed to create something akin to what we now call open world games, right? Like to provide lots of agency in um, fantastical settings. I'm speaking a little bit out of my butthole here because I'm not super versed in the ways of the history of the development of D&D, but that is, a, in, a, in a nutshell, the, the too long didn't read version is that that's why it was uh, created. It does completely make sense that once computers and computer programming were more of a thing that people would try to do the same things that they were doing in these tabletop games on a computer instead. Most of the really early games are less story-based and are in some ways more like D&D because you, in many cases, can create your character. I mean, when you're DMing a game, what sort of things do you have in mind for like options for your party? How much can you think ahead to what their decisions might be and how can you like sort of plan for these sort of things? First of all, full disclosure, I'm still in my, actually just completed my first full year of DMing. So um, take anything I say with a grain of salt, you know, I'm far from any kind of authority on the subject, but uh, when I try to plan for what my players may or may not want to do, I try to provide um, a world that is effectively a backdrop. And by that, I mean that it's actually not as detailed as people realize. I kind of just sort of plot out big routes, specific without being overly specific or like without pigeonholing you. And I think that's, I don't want to make it sound like my world is, you know, like the epitome. If you really want a good example of this stuff, go look at like any of the D&D, you know, series you can look at on YouTube. But there's way too many for me to recommend here. But uh, point being, um, I think that's a good litmus test. And this is one way that JRPGs differ from D&D. &D. Having that sort of expansive open worldness is possible when we are all at the same table basically improvising around one another. But, you know, when you're creating a console game, um, you gotta really hone out all those details to keep the player's interest. I mean, like, to use an example of something polar opposite from improvisation, just because Final Fantasy XIII is, like, purely hallway as opposed to D&D, which is purely not, you know. Uh, but if you look at the comparison of those two things, FF13's world, even if you hate it, is super detailed, right? Like there's a whole, you could spend hours just reading the encyclopedia it gives you in the options, as opposed to like someone like my campaign setting or even like Matt Mercer's settings in Critical Role, how much of that is really stuff he's planned versus how much of it is Matt Mercer is a professional actor with amazing improv skills. Have you played any Western RPG video games? I mean, Skyrim. Uh, okay. Yeah, I, I I've haven't. played pretty much all the Elder Scrolls. Yeah, I, I haven't really played any of those. From an outsider's perspective, of the ones I've seen, like, like I've, I've watched my roommate play Bioshock Infinite and one of the fallouts. From an outsider's perspective, it seems like some of those games are a little bit closer to you know the JRPGs that we're used to because they do have pretty defined characters and um, pretty defined stories to them still. But 
exactly how you deal with every situation can differ with, with each playthrough. Like, you know, things like, you know, essentially alignment or if you come between two factions of people that are fighting each other, which side you choose to help will have some impact on how things go in the game. But still, like, the main story beats are generally pretty set. You know, I would say that, though, that really isn't the same with the rest Western RPGs we just named. Like, in my opinion, Bioshock, for example, is much more linear than, say, the Elder Scrolls games, which yeah. are far more open world. And frankly, in my opinion, I don't find most of the Elder Scrolls games, main plots at least, to be that interesting. Sort of by necessity, right? They have to be generic enough to allow basically any character type to enter in there. I think that's actually sort of an interesting point because I, that's part of why I've never really been super interested in playing an open world game on my own. Because though you do have so many more options open to you, you still have fewer options open to you than you do in a D&D game. Because you can potentially, you know, with the, with the right DM in the right role, you can potentially do pretty much anything in a D&D game. You, you can only do what the options that are programmed in allow you to do in an open world RPG. One thing I've learned about D&D games as opposed to that, and something I'm still learning to tamper as a DM is that like, Sometimes you have to be careful with how interesting your main plot becomes because it can easily dwarf or sort of swallow the individual character's plot points. One of the sort of draws of d and I guess, is that you can create any character plot you want and then therefore any character can drive the plot in any way that you want them to. Some people are playing for the story aspect more than others and so it may not even be fair necessarily to place that expectation of driving the main narrative forward on all players as opposed to, and like this is another way that like a show like Critical Role or any of these D&D shows for instance, I'm just naming that because it's the most famous, but um, they all can sometimes be bad models because these are trained actors who are trained to like write their own narratives and interesting backstories, you know, whereas maybe Johnny Golightly just wants to fucking roll dice and kill things. Yeah, and actually in, in the case of some of these shows that are on YouTube, I am not convinced that they're all ad-libbed. I'm, I'm sure that some of them have major plot points set up ahead of like, at some point in this game, we want your character to do this, okay? <laughs> like, I'm, I'm sure that many of them are completely like real games, but I don't think all of them are. But I think an open world Western RPG versus a more scripted JRPG um, I'm always going to be more interested in a more scripted JRPG because it has the capacity to, you know, take you along like a really good story arc, like any good story with a beginning and a middle and an end, that the pacing of the story can be completely messed up if you can do whatever you want, or you can just like entirely skip story beats in in a game like that, where is, though that is a draw for many players, I, it's not necessarily one for me. I would much rather, when I'm playing by myself and, I'm, and, I, and I only have very limited options for what I can do, I would rather you use that to tell me the best story you can. Yeah, totally. I hear you. I was watching the Game Maker's video and <laughs> I've actually played two Dragon Quest games in addition to the Final Fantasy, like, negative 1 through 15 that I've played at this point in my life, which is, you know, Final Fantasy has taken up the majority of my life at this point in my life. But point being, I've played Dragon Quest 3 and Dragon Quest 11, which is interesting because Dragon Quest 3, I remember being like a super typical JRPG, like to the point where I got bored with it. I don't even think I finished it. But then Dragon Quest 11, I was not expecting to like this game the way that I liked it because every plot point is so predictable. You know every plot point before it comes, and yet you are so excited for each one. Like, I knew we were gonna get a flying whale, but when we got a flying whale, I fucking pissed myself. <laughs> it was amazing. To me, it sort of speaks to how, in different ways, JRPGs and D&D are both sometimes style over substance. JRPGs probably more so, but I think really both. Before we hopped on this call, I was thinking about the ways in which 
a more scripted JRPG like a Final Fantasy game gives you options. And usually in, when it's in a Final Fantasy game, those options are primarily in character development. Like you can choose what your character is good at, but you can't really change their personality. Final Fantasy is one through three before the characters really had personalities. There was more of a feeling like D&D because you could figure out who these characters were. You could build your party. You could do what you want with them like that. But then after that, there's still some hint of that that still exists in many of the Final Fantasy games, especially the ones with job systems and ones where every character is basically a blank slate and you can do whatever you want with them. But also I tend to prefer characters that have set roles already built for them that if you're using this character, this is your tank. Do you have a preference either way for I, that? I prefer that in general too, really. I think that, first of all, from a purely mechanical perspective, in D&D &D at least, it tends to work best when everybody optimizes their own role as opposed to trying to play multiple roles. It's certainly not as interesting on an individual perspective at least in D&D, &D, but um, I like that too though because in my opinion, it's a better reflection of real life. Like everyone has their part to play, you know, everyone has their talents. And I guess you could say most of us by virtue of having to live in an individualistic westernized society, I guess most of us are multi-classes, <laughs> but um, I don't know, it's not as interesting to me. And I'm the type, I don't mind if my role or if the story is predictable, if it's told really well. Mm -hmm. uh, because if we're being honest, most of these stories really do boil down to a typical good versus evil, you know, universal morality type of story. And the details can certainly differ in, interest, in interesting ways as well. But to me, the way it's told is the coolest part of all. I was thinking through specific games, in the, especially in the Final Fantasy canon, because that's the type of games that I know the most about that are that have a large you know body to them but if, if we're looking through all the final fantasy games there's a little bit more creativity in how you can build your characters the character development within most of the characters itself is strong enough that i feel for them as characters instead of what their function is in battle like the battle system is one of the last things on the things I like about Final Fantasy VI. Having said that, Square Enix, if you're watching, please remake Final Fantasy VI. I would buy the shit out of it anyway. Um, Actually, I was just talk talking about that in um, one of the Facebook groups I'm on. Somebody asked what game they would want to see remade. And someone said, well, what do you think about Final Fantasy VI? And I said, you know, I'm actually just so nervous about a Final Fantasy VI remake. Like there's that iOS port that changes all the uh, all the designs and graphics to be that like really pastel soft lines thing, and I think it completely lost all of its charm when you did that. I kind of find the the pixely sprite work in the original Final Fantasy to be like really beautiful and charming, and it fits the exact right tone that it should for the game. Um, not to say that there are things that I wouldn't change. Yeah, I kind of don't want a Final Fantasy remake. I would rather a new game in that vein made. <laughs> but I don't know, what old game do I want remade? Chrono Trigger. Yeah, yeah, that is one that I actually Chrono Trigger. say that. Oh, no, the, the one that I said, um, I would really love it if they remade and actually finished Xenogears. Yes, I was about to say that, okay. Okay, yes. yes. Uh, <laughs> so I feel like what, what we're really getting at here, and I think the biggest and most important difference in D&D &D and, and, and uh, Final Fantasy and JRPGs is really like the level of agency, not so much in player development, but in plot and player choices there. And really, if we're being realistic in a JRPG, that's not going to change, right? The, the plot choices have to be pre-selected for you, even in scenarios like Persona, for example, where they sort of give you the illusion of agency, you, you don't have agency. It's still going the same direction. Plot is one of those things that people always say they really, really want in a game, but when push comes to shove, they tend to skip over those elements. 
Like, I mean, you're saying, for example, you love to talk to most NPCs in most towns. I imagine that that may not be true for most players, or at least for a significant number of players, right? I mean, most Twitches that I watch for JRPGs aren't really spending their time doing that. And similarly, I think that agency functions sometimes the same way. People like to think they want a lot of agency, but when push comes to shove, they don't have a lot to do with it. I think that what we really want, and people are afraid to admit because it sounds a little banal, I think we just want excitement, right? I think we just want intrigue and cool shit, and we want to feel engaged. And, you know, if that means that we have a decision in the matter or we don't, does that really make much of a difference? I mean, look at Final Fantasy VII. No agency in that game, right? Zero agency, at least for the, first, like, the parts that most people remember, but so engaging that you don't care. I don't know. I'm probably assuming a lot here, though. I think we can assume those sort of things about JRPG players, not necessarily about video game players. Because I think some video game players, they're like the type that like, oh, there's a mountain in the distance. I want to go climb it. <laughs> and not like, I, I can't wait until there's a reason for me to climb that, <laughs> which is more how I would think. But there's some people that are like that. I want to go, I see that. I want to go do that right now. And that that's, something that you know in that case a jrpg probably isn't for you <laughs> yeah you know as we're sitting here talking about another thought occurs to me too like as i compare it in my head playing like an elder scrolls game which are the main western rpgs i've played with a final fantasy game it's interesting because you would think these open world games would have the kinds of worlds that would really interest you but the final fantasy worlds tend to interest me more and i think it's because really the npcs interest me more and are more memorable. In Skyrim, I don't think I could name you a single character. And I've beaten and played that game so many times, so many times. But like, I can name every single Sid from each Final Fantasy game, even though they all have the same name and describe to you exactly what the difference is, right. you know? Or like you can go into like a character that we may have extra strong feelings about it, even though they're actually quite small characters in the plot, like Scala in Chrono Trigger. Like, I have feelings about her, even though she's in a very small portion of the game. The NPCs, for, for me, the NPCs in Skyrim, at least, they just feel all the same. You know, it's like, oh, now you're the new asshole I report to. Okay, cool. Are we done yet? Thank you. Which I think is, is also interesting, because if we look back at the earliest JRPGs, like the first couple Dragon Quest slash Warriors, and the first couple of Final Fantasies, like even when there are characters who are named and have personalities, we don't really know anything about them. Hey, R.I.P. Sarah. I don't, does Sarah die? I don't actually know. Is she, <laughs> <laughs> is Sarah a woman? I don't know. I don't know anything about Sarah. <laughs> well, I, I, there, there, there's a Sarah in Final Fantasy three also, I think. And I think she might die, but I'm not positive. Final Fantasy XIII Sarah or no Sarah, okay? <laughs> Just kidding. She's not good. But she got to ride that motorcycle through an active <laughs> fireworks scene. And she got a whole sequel, even though we all thought that sequel was for Lightning, which is great. <laughs> but it's okay. Lightning returned. <laughs> but also, though, that sequel had a pretty good soundtrack and also was pretty fun, even though the plot is total garbage, but also, okay, I'm done. Uh, <laughs> no, there's, there are other Final Fantasy sequels that the plot is total garbage, but are fun to play, like Final Fantasy X. Yeah. And you know what? Actually, that brings me to another point that I wanted to bring up, which is that sometimes in Final Fantasy especially, and maybe this is the fact that I'm playing Final Fantasy XIV right now, which is the king of what I'm about to tell you as an MMORPG, but sometimes the style or the appearance and the aesthetic is literally enough. I think that we are quick, quicker to dismiss that than we should be. I don't think that should be our main concern when we play video games or any other kind of media, but you know, there's something to be said for, for once, not having a fucking Tolkien-inspired style. Credit where credit is due, the styles of FF13 versus FF12 versus FF10 versus FF9, 8, 7 are all pretty different. Yeah, but I think it's also tying back to the point that you made earlier that like when you're creating a world for a D&D &D campaign to take place in, you want there to not necessarily be that much specificity to it. 
Um, whereas it, it makes more sense to have more specificity in a JRPG where you are being given all of this information, being told all of this information, instead of having to discover it for yourself. But also a whole lot can be learned just from, you know, moving to that next screen and seeing something in the distance than a DM explaining it to you. But at the same time, I also think there's something special at the D&D table about just theater of the minding something collectively. If I were to sit here and describe, for example, and again, I'm just going to use the most common one everyone's played, the world of FF7 to like a room of four people and not show them a picture, each one of them is going to have a pretty different picture. And that's sort of what's cool about it. I think we tend to think that immersion and good writing needs to be like manically detailed, you know, in that way that Final Fantasy games are on screen, right? Like the FF13 cinema sequences. If there's a million things to look at. By comparison, if you listen to most professional DMs when they describe things, there's like maybe two, three details. Um, but that's the magic of it too. Yeah, and I think we could also relate that to something in Final Fantasy itself, notably from Final Fantasies one through nine and then 10 on with voice acting. Because I think, you know, the audiation of reading text and imagining how a character would say that in your head versus having a voice actor, however talented they may be, saying this is the way the character reads that line. There, there are some moments in some of the earlier Final Fantasy games where something a character says can be interpreted several different ways depending on what emphasis they put on it. And you usually can figure out through context clues what they really mean, but that's another thing that's just like spelled out for you more specifically in Final Fantasies X and forward. Yeah, it's funny you say that. I used to not really have an issue with the voice acting, but lately I do think I kind of in some ways miss it, miss not having it. I miss it all not being voice acted. Like as an example, Again, I'm playing a FF14 right now. I think I've already said that a couple times. And uh, what's weird about this world they created is they really tried hard to make it very diverse. I mean, there's a Doma, which is supposed to be very reminiscent of like China or East Asian countries in general. Um, there are many beast races like pixies, uh, kobolds, but every single voice actor in this game has a British accent everyone yeah everyone i think it might trace back to the tolkien influence that a british guy wrote the most famous fantasy novels and so we just assume fantasy equals british accent the other thing i'll say about dnd that i found is different and not to my liking so much sometimes is um because of the way it's paced you know you the pacing really is quite different from leveling up once every three battles to leveling up once every eight to 10 to 12 sometimes hours of gameplay. And so what that means is like in Final Fantasy, you ramp up pretty quick to killing God. <laughs> I mean, you don't, you skip a few steps really, if we're being honest. Um, but in D&D, you might be fighting that gang of thieves for like a hundred hours. Yeah, Like, real talk. And for me, I guess maybe partly because I was raised on JRPGs, that's a lot. It's not just that. A good DM finds variety, right? But point being, like, for me, by my 100th hour or so, I need to be going up against some gods. I get that. Um, I don't know if I necessarily feel the same way about how I view this stuff. It's sort of one of the things that I like about this week Hoden series, there may be world changing implications to each of the games, but there's no like, we have to kill God at the end of a week Hoden game. Each game focuses mostly on one, two or three countries that have some conflict. And then that conflict in this area is settled at the end of the game, which I think is really kind of refreshing, but it also sort of relates back to something else that I've been talking about with my roommate, Bob, with superhero media. So much of the Marvel Cinematic Universe in general, especially, is 
building up to one huge big bad after every you know x number of movies and it's like this one can destroy all life and this one eats planets and it's like those are the least interesting villains to me i want the stories that are more personal and have real like interpersonal ramifications to the the story that you know these sort of things could be happening to people without superpowers they just happen to be happening with pe- two people with superpowers so like as much as captain marvel is amazing and she's a great character she's also in some ways a less interesting character because she's so powerful that's all just my opinion on these things and i can see how you know a bigger payoff after fighting a bigger enemy might be worth it too <laughs> well you know is worth it Yeah, well, I think that it also sort of ties back again to the players you have at the table and the DM you have at the table. Just like it, the parallel details in another Final Fantasy can make or break it too, right? Like, great plot, but crappy NPCs and crappy party characters are going to ruin it for you. What JRPG can you think of that has a really excellent plot and has really great ideas to it, but you hate the cast? This is going to sound weird. Final Fantasy XII, I think. I like some of the cast, but most of the cast? I don't care for the two kids. I don't care for Fran. I like Fran. I honestly don't even care that much for Bosch and his stupid twin brother plot. I think it's kind of lame. Yeah. I care Um, for Balthier and Ash. Actually, much. really, it, just Ash. <laughs> She's the actual main character. Yeah. From that game. Yeah. But um, the the actual plot and the setting are great. Yeah. Well, and, and that's the one Final Fantasy, well, the one mainline Final Fantasy that isn't as much about some world-ending plot. There's the implication that Vane, if he kept going at the route he would, could have gotten to, you know, world-ending god status. But it's about conflict in one area of the world. Actually, the the other game that I was going to talk about that the plot and the themes and the ideas in the game are so great, but the cast really isn't. But we talked about this before. It's really just because the cast is such a blank slate cast. Earthbound. It's such a good game. It's one of my all-time favorites. But other than a few moments here and there, namely with Jeff and his boyfriend, um, there's nothing really to relate to with any of the characters in how they interact with each other and with NPCs. But a little you know, bit of Ness and Paula. But I think that's almost the point of those characters is to be easily grafted upon by the player. Maybe you don't always need great characters. <laughs> well, that's what I'm saying. Like, it, it depends on the context. Uh, but at the same time, I don't think there's a way to make Earthbound a compelling tabletop RPG. No. I mean, half of the humor is in the, the visual aesthetic, really. Yeah. yeah. And we were talking about music earlier. Like, that game, that music fits that world so well. and But so would really, fit no other world as well. Right. Also, this is sort of a like retread of an earlier thought that but since we were just talking about music, the way that one of the better scripted JRPGs can really reel you into a moment in storytelling is through the music. And I don't know of open world games that do that in the same way. Yeah. It's funny you say that. I really try to evoke that same effect in my games. I mean, I use actual JRPG soundtracks, but it's been to sort of varying effects. Um, It works especially well for extended DM narration sequences where I need to really set up a new scenario or provide important plot context does not work as well for like just sort of day-to-day NPC interactions. Sometimes also does not work well for plot. I wonder if part of the reason that it's harder to do something like that when you're DMing a D&D game, something like that with music, I mean, is because people playing a D&D game don't always come in with the same baggage. Whereas if you're playing a JRPG, any moment in that game can be more effective because you have the baggage of the musical language of the rest of the game. 
that you, that's led up to that point. Yeah, you know, um, I've been thinking about this in the way that leitmotifs function in JRPGs. Um, you see this a lot, for example, in Final Fantasy X with the uh, Suteki Dane theme, which appears in many other parts of the game, or in Fire Emblem, which I just, not just finished playing, I've been replaying for the last COVID tide. Um, <laughs> but they use a lot of the leitmotifs from the vocal theme song of that game. And, and in other ways, you know, they echo leitmotifs that aren't from the vocal music too. Um, this is true of many JRPGs. Uh, and it really does serve well to evoke emotions that you had previously that are harder to make happen in a D&D game where like it's been two weeks since most of these people have heard this music or even one week. So the, the narrative continuity can't be established as easily through the music. And I think Uematsu in the Final Fantasy games that he did, not all of the games he did rely on character themes, but when they do, he can use them to like really great effect. Again, going back to Final Fantasy VI, which I will always do forever, Celeste's theme in Final Fantasy VI, you hear three times in the game. First in the opera scene, and we'll come back to the second, the last time you hear it is in the final credits. <laughs> the, the only other time you hear her theme is at the moment after she has come back to the party, after everyone thinks that she betrayed them. And she and Locke have just a really brief conversation at night in Albrook. Locke is trying to reach out to her and apologize to her. And she doesn't have any dialogue. Instead, we hear her theme played by that uh, played by a music box and it's like we know exactly how she's feeling because of the way Uematsu put that into the score right at that moment and it's so perfect but you know I think now that I hear you talk about this and I think about it I feel like we're sort of dancing around a really important key aspect of all this that makes that sort of musical narrative telling less possible which is that really what a lot of this music is functioning to do in JRPGs is graft a feeling onto the player, right? As you just stated. Um, whereas in D&D, half of the fun and the point for many people is agency of emotion too. Like, what if I want to play the character who's a douchebag and who is not moved at all, you know? So then me playing my sentimental JRPG music isn't really going to help you there, you know? Um, and then there's a sort of give and take too of like how much of it does the DM want to graft because sometimes that is appropriate. Like if the party just defeated the big bad and one of the party members is evil, you're still going to play something to make them feel good about the fact that they just killed the big bad. I wonder then if in a D&D &D game it often would be better suited to helping explain a location than moods like you could figure out what kind of tavern you've just walked into based on what kind of music is playing <laughs> you know what's the general mood in among the npcs in this town instead of the dm telling you they could add to that by just picking the right music to play yeah it can definitely be part of showing and not telling i was just trying to think if there's anything else that i wanted to touch on before we started to wrap this up anything else from you no, I think we had a pretty good discussion. It was robust. Yeah, this is fun. Audience, it's December 22nd, and you're still breathing in 2020. You go, Glen Coco. All right, bye, everybody. And bye, Ramin. Good night. Good night. Bye, bye. <laughs> um, while I was waiting for you, I got bored. <laughs> Made some decoration on one of my niece's pillows. Are you happy to have time with your? Oh, with your? I was going to say family, but pillow clearly is the first question I should ask. I, I, I do love pillows. They are one of my favorite parts of beds.